Hello and welcome to the Idea Cast interview series episode number 90. My guest in this episode is Dr. Rianne Crane, and she is a philosopher of language, a Huxley scholar, and an educator. And in this conversation, we talk about her project, Semantics Sessions. We also talk more broadly about language, communication, semantics, and her work with studying psychedelics and a little bit about Aldous Huxley. So it was a pleasure having a conversation with her. I learned a lot and I very much enjoyed having her as a guest and I anticipate bringing her back for further conversation. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as well and thank you for being here. I'd like to welcome Dr. Rianne Crane to the IdeaCast interview series. I'm looking forward to an informative and entertaining conversation because Rianne and I have been speaking to each other off this conversation uh, for a little bit, and and uh, we we tend to we tend to get ourselves in trouble at just having incredible conversations that go zero to seven hundred miles an hour. So we're I'm gonna, looking, we're, we're gonna give it content. Gonna, yeah, we pro, we yeah. pinky swore to ourselves that this one wouldn't be off the rails too far. But anyway, it may go that way, but it'll all be in context. So anyway, Dr. Crane, welcome. Um, again, looking forward to speaking with you about uh, various things. <laughs> it's the second time we've uh, attempted to to start yeah. recording this. Just to just. I know. I know. Yes, I know. but but we shall nonetheless uh, uh, avail ourselves to <laughs> produce a good conversation. And by the way, welcome YouTube audience. Glad to have you here. Uh, I hope this will be uh, a, an entertaining and informative conversation. We're looking. To, I'm looking to extract from uh, Rianne uh, that which she knows and that which she studied and uh, prospered <laughs> in terms of getting a PhD. So uh, on that note, would you like to go ahead and just share a little bit of background on uh, sort yes. of an academic background and, and where you've yes. come from and, and, and bring us up to present? So, um, yeah, as you say, Dr. Anne Crane, I am, a, I suppose you could say, a philosopher of language, and my real concern is um, basically the ways in which language and perception are um, entangled. Um, and I suppose the more that you understand language, the more that you can sculpt your attention, which has become really, really relevant um, as we're in this kind of psychedelic resurgence um, you know, this is huge questions of how can we integrate psychedelics into into medicine or alternative states of consciousness. And I'm strongly of the opinion that you can't do this unless you really understand how how much language influences um, your day to day experience. Um, and yeah, I, I suppose what you can do to understand that better and. You know, we, to be perfectly um, frank with you, Justin, like we we don't really understand what language is as a culture. Um, we, we have a really, really warped view of what language is. Um, you know, that in that we don't like, we don't experience something and then kind of analyze its meaning. You know, it's just, it's never as linear as that. You know, we just bring a lifetime's worth of kind of metaphorical models to every single new sensation and you, and you know we have this assumption that language is is like the names that we give to stuff that's real in the world um but it, but it isn't Lang language shapes how we encounter the world um you know how we understand ourselves what we, we pay attention to what we don't pay attention to and what my passion is 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 just exploring how language and perception are in this um sort of constant tango and it's something that I really see is as absent from this kind of psychedelic renaissance resurgence, whatever you want to call it. We have these immensely powerful technologies for altering perception, and we have nowhere near the same flexibility in terms of our language patterns, um, you know, which is why this whole concept of the ineffable is so widespread. This this idea that um that the psychedelic experience is is beyond words and just to um as you say kind of go back to where this all started um i've i i've been gripped by language for like as long as i could um speak uh, as long as i can remember because i 
I had a really intense um, stammer when I was a kid, and it's nowhere it's nowhere ne- it's nowhere near like it used to be. I, I don't even know if I've mentioned this um, to you in in our pre chats. Um, but I remember being I was about four years old, and I had this um, big crimson puffer jacket, which is or was called a bubble coat in the uh, north of England, and I could not say this word bubble just wouldn't come out. Yeah. And at the same time, we had like, we had, you know, one of the first Nintendos and there was this like duck shooting game. Couldn't say duck either. And you know, when you're like four years old and your world is really small. So these words like bubble and duck came up every single day. And there were like these mountains of black holes where I was like, yeah, bu- bu- bubble. And they were joined eventually by other words beginning with B or D and then the like words beginning with C start to cause problems and words beginning with G. Um, and it was an issue with plosives where, where you have to like block the airflow and then release it. It's like bu- bubble. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, I didn't have a concept of plosives at the time, but intuited that these were the these like sounds have something in common and you know this is England in the 1990s people didn't take the kids to speech therapists or whatever but w- w- what it was was when I was really young I had to sort of get used to um I guess switching phrases around you know avoiding or avoiding words that began with these sounds um so since being really really young language wasn't just this sort of it wasn't just this thing thing to name the things it was this kind of obstacle in itself and you know just just as as I was um you know kind of like thinking about this conversation I was I was really reflecting on just how much that influences your your uh, relationship with language because you you really have to want it. Like if if a quarter of the sounds that you might produce, you're going to stumble on, you have to really want to say what, you, what you're going to try and say. Um, and I think that that is where this sort of fascination from, with language sort of came from. Um, that's before the academic stuff. Seems like the analogy that came to my mind is that if you were bitten by a dog as a child, that you grew up to be a keeper of a no-kill shelter with dogs, especially dogs that were having socialization problems. Like you kind of, it, you brought yourself into it to understand it fully and make it useful for you or make it useful for the community that you interact with. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, as, as the, the, there are certain ways that you can get around it in English it's not really a big issue for me now and and there are certain tricks as well so like if if you struggle with these so like if you struggle with the word dad if you put like a subtle like m sound before the before the d for like "Mm, dad Mm -hmm. there's a kind of continuity in in those in those sounds and it can be so subtle that you would you wouldn't even notice it but um you know, but you know, people people are doing that from a really, really young age. They're 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 doing some iteration of that, and then it it only came up for me as I was learning second languages, um, which is, I guess, where my kind of academic um, journey. So, so I I studied Chinese at undergrad, okay. and it wasn't you know, it wasn't really intrigue for the culture. I'm, I'm, you know, from a very sort of working class background in, in the north of England. And to be honest, I kind of just wanted to, I wanted to travel. I wanted to just get away. Um, and the, 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 the issue that I had with trying to learn Chinese or any other foreign language was that this, this stammer came back as though I was mm. like four years old. Mm. Mm. That's very um, interesting. Really, but then really the, the neuroscience there would, I would find that interesting uh, that, <clears throat> and I don't know, you know, how, I, I know that at, at a young age, language tends to uh, onboard re- relatively easily. And that as we become adults, that we lose that uh, capability. I know there was a 
not to go on a tangent here, I promise, but there was a documentary about a, a Russian girl who was raised by dogs. Her parents were alcoholics and they threw her out in the backyard and the dogs mm -hmm. raised her and she didn't learn language. And she crossed the threshold. She was uh, pubescent or uh, pre-pubescent, pubescent. And so she spoke dog or whatever it was that she had interacted with the dogs and they couldn't rehabilitate her. She never was able to pick up Russian from that point on. So, so no, I'm just being dramatic about how, how there's this sort of window that kind of closes. Cause I've, I've been struggling to learn Spanish most of my life because um, one of my parents, the, the one that raised me grew up in Venezuela and Spain, and they spoke fluently before they even learned English. They didn't teach me Spanish. They, you know, I learned a few words when they were mad, mm -hmm. but you know, that was about it. But, um, you know, I grew up in a kind of Spanish centric culture and, 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 and now I live in Florida where there's you know, a lot of Spanish speaking, especially in South Florida. And so it's always been a, a, a lure to me, but, uh, it's been, challenge and fortunately right now i just took a new job where i'm surrounded i have about eight co-workers that are fluent in spanish and and some of them don't even speak english so it's a great opportunity i'm in there just like every day just like as an adult trying to fumble my way through <laughs> so it's fascinating yeah. how the brain so I, I i'll bring that back around to the chinese and that you are an adult learning chinese and god help you because <laughs> it could be a challenge i i mean i i i passed my i passed my degree but um I mean, I, I couldn't have a conversation with you in, in Chinese now. I, I have to be, I have to be perfectly honest. But what that did teach me was that um, I, I, I remember, I remember realizing this, and it, and it seems so obvious now. I remember I, I was on my year abroad, so I'm three years into learning Chinese at a university level, and I'm in the bathroom at this university in China, and and you know, it's all the little squat toilets, and I finished classes for the day, and I'm you know, like, I'm like, I'm like peeing in the squat toilet. And there's this like Chinese girl next to me and there's a storm outside. And we're both like looking at the window and this Chinese girl, she looks at the window and she looks at me and she's like, ah, ma fan. And I understood the word ma fan to mean like troublesome, but she was saying it in reference to the weather. And uh, that, that was one of the moments where I was like, oh, like, oh, I'm not just learning to like, I'm not just learning like another symbolic system to put on top of like a reality that's like solid, like like all the categories and how they kind of then are different. And, and I think from that moment on, I, I realized that like, if I was gonna learn Chinese, like it, it, I had to kind of learn to see again um and that the the labels just didn't really they just weren't really relevant you couldn't mm. just do like a one like a one-on-one -on -one sort of swap and and that and I think that is really what led me into being interested in sort of perception and altered states of consciousness mm. um and you know and, and even but even like learning Spanish, you see that a little bit, you know, if if you look at like te quiero versus te amo. So mm -hmm. you hear the stamina in Spanish. Yeah. Um, to, you know, two versions of I love you. And I and I like English, like monolingual English speakers that like, really struggle with that distinction. Mm -hmm. Um you know and 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 there isn't like a simple answer or like a simple description in english of like when to use like e each one yeah yeah and and that's just like that's just fascinating to me yeah yeah and that's something i i ask my coworkers now like what's the best way to say something like in que te haces or que estás haciendo you know well, like what are what are the and and what are the contexts or the situations that it's best and he, and even with time like it's like sometimes they'll say those you know those say menos uh, quince or uh once uh, 45 you know so like is it is it quarter to 12 or is it 11 45 yeah. and she's uh, one lady said well it's south america they like to do the negative and and in central america and mexico they do the the positive or whatever whatever the arrangement was but yeah you're right and 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 that's something that's lost on an anglophile or anglophone like myself and what and what i've been exploring is just just how much that influences that your experience of the world and your your actual like perception of what's happening at any particular moment and um 
you know, so, so Spanish and English or, or the kind of like Latin based languages, like, you know, we're from a similar philosophical heritage, you know, that kind of Greek, mm-hmm. Plato, et cetera. Um, but, but even among kind of English and Spanish, you get these, you get these terms that don't really translate like, um, like, I always feel that um, the term ganas in Spanish doesn't quite translate like tengo, tengo ganas. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's, yeah, like I have this will or I have desire to do something. But for me, it seems to encapsulate like a spiritual desire to do something and the kind of energy physically to do it in a mm-hmm. way that like I don't feel quite works in English. Like mm-hmm. it's slightly more embodied. Yeah. Than, than any version and, and just just how how much because as soon as you start to like learn that and notice that you know even you don't need to be fluent in the language but like that's it it just affects what kind of categories that you you pay attention to um i know even within the language i my physician my general uh, physician is cuban and she and I have wonderful conversations when I go to see her. We we talk about me a little bit, but then I, I ask her a lot of questions about Cuban culture because I I went there once and I just I love that island. And anyway, um, she was telling me one time that things can get lost in translation, even in inter inter Spanish communication, because she was in Honduras uh, during a residency, and in Central America, the word coger is a vulgar term. And apologies to any uh, Central American Spanish speakers. Uh, in Cuba, it literally means, you know, give it to me or, or, or I, you know, it's some yeah, it's a, relational thing. Right. But cool. it means copulation in, in Mexico. And so, so when, yeah, 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 there has some, yeah, you know, you can course, see yeah. the, the nuance and the inference there, but, but she said to another doctor over a balcony in a public area, like Coherame, something, you know, boom, boom. And everybody's like, well, you know, and in Cuba, it just means, you know, give it to me or, or, you know, bring it to me or whatever the, whatever the literal, uh, you know, the innocent meaning of it is. So she was telling me how embarrassed she was about that and how quickly she learned not to use the term yeah. Coher in that, in that uh, particular culture or that particular region but that but that that that's where you really see it right it's it's that like learning another language or even like learning a a different dialect it's not just like memorizing different words it's like relearning to see and feel or unlearning to see and feel in the ways that you're used to in order to sort of make space for different configurations of of categories Mm -hmm. um and it took me years to understand this um like and I mean, like years, and I was studying languages, and it I don't even think it's a particularly sort of difficult concept, but I think just because like l- language learning it's never really presented to Anglophiles in that way, or certainly it wasn't it wasn't when I was you know like learning French in school mm-hmm. um and it just really it really really took me a long time to 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 see to see that there isn't. There, there isn't like a solid world with labels stuck yeah. on it. Yeah. Your, your being from the north of England reminds me of a story. And again, these are gentle little tangents. So that they, again, they're all context specific. But I was crossing from Newcastle on Tyne to um, to Esbjerg, Denmark one time on one of those overnight car ferries. And uh, I got up super early in the morning and it was September. So it was still, you know, it was daylight, like 14 hours a day. And we were in the North Sea and they had the the oil rigs and they were illuminating the sky. So there was a green, angry, angry ocean, you know, the waves were really big and cloud. It was very overcast. And these things, these rigs were lighting up the sky with their uh, outgassing and and burning of whatever hydrocarbons they were burning off. And I met a Geordie and, and he and I were the only people probably up at four or five in the morning watching this. And we couldn't understand each other. I I didn't understand a word he said, even though he's from the UK (laughs) being that thick Geordie (laughs) accent. And we slowed down and we tried, but it was, it would have been beautiful on film because uh, I was lost. He was, tr- he was trying to understand my mid-Atlantic American accent. It was a beautiful experience. We worked it out, but it, it was a struggle and we were both speaking English, but you know, anyway. I, no, I, I, well, I, I went to university in Newcastle for my undergrad, <laughs> so I can certainly relate to that. I, 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 I remember reading somewhere that like in the US, they had to, subtitle Cheryl mm. Cole um who is you know kind of a I think a judge on the x factor or something like that uh-huh. but but I had the same issue I remember <sighs> going to uh 
New Orleans, not in New Orleans, but uh-huh. you know, I have, I have friends from kind of Baton Rouge, like Lafayette area, uh-huh. and we were like down in like the bayou. And I remember having having the same issue there of having to like ask for like, ask ask for translations. <laughs> Repeat yourself eight times. Yeah, yeah. That Creole accent is tough because it's French. It's not. It's not even. You know, it's English that's uh, francophonic. You know, and so yeah. And then there's a Southern dialect on top of that. Although in Louisiana, I think it's it's. So, I've lived in the South of the United States mm. most of my life, so I understand Southern. <laughs> yeah. So so, but it's different. It's almost a Midwestern French kind of. Thing. Thing. it's it's different but yeah I, yeah I understand because your ears from the UK it it would be difficult it would be like myself and the Geordie or even a thick Irish brogue like I've been to Ireland a few times and it's like huh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they have their own little thing going especially when they get Gaelic-y on you you know they start Gaelic Gaelic English kind of crossover stuff so. <laughs> yeah and I, I, I remember like sort of like like preparing to meet the, the parents of like just just a friend and I knew that in the South, like everyone would be like Mr. And then the first name, like Mr. Jeff. Mm-hmm. I, was like, I was like, do I have to call your dad Mr. Jeff? Because it, it sounds really weird in my, it sounds really <laughs> weird in my accent. Yeah, that's a Southern thing. <laughs> They're like, no, 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 you don't. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's there, but yeah. So, so to go back to something you said earlier, and and in language and perception, it's almost like I was getting this image that language is is a carrier wave of sorts, and whether they're signal or static, uh, it, is a, it's fragile, right? You know, so so I don't know if that's landing with you. Like when we when we use language, um, it's very contingent, right? It's all yeah. construct. It's all arbitrary or not arbitrary, but it's abstraction. You know, it's abstraction away from something that's you know. So we're trying to concretize reconcretize something like there's a stone you know <laughs> well what is a stone you know a, a stone is a, is a hard you know so you have to use metaphors to describe metaphors to describe it's an infinite regress and so i almost think it's like a carrier wave where it's kind of like the idea of sonic uh expression or whatever we want to call this this acceptive thing that came out of our evolution um it's just a carrier wave literally i mean it's sound and and then writing of course is an exception but what how how could you improve that? <laughs> what I just said. It, I mean, does it, it make sense? Yes. No. It, it is the most freaking mysterious, yeah. mysterious thing that just surrounds us all the time, and and we really, really take it for granted. And um, <laughs> I I almost feel bad in what I'm sort of trying to <laughs> trying to devote my life to because it's sort of like um. <laughs> Um, it's 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 bringing far more questions than yeah. than answers. Um, but that's good science, right? I mean, if you can, I mean, <laughs> if you can open up a box of questions, then yeah, <laughs> rather than resolution. Um. Okay, so let's 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 um. And it's 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 also it's really really hard to talk about language because you're using language to talk about the thing that you're talking about. So yeah. it it's it it's it. It's really difficult to do that. Um, okay, so let's. Think about an alternative just to sort of put some of this into perspective, because you're sort of mentioning metaphors and sort of using metaphors. Um, so first of all, so me- metaphors are everywhere. We can't we can't speak without 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 metaphors. Um, and. If you're using Chinese, for example, um, so unlike the letters of the Latin alphabet, which are somewhat kind of abstract, they're, they're phonetic, they're based on sound. Mm. Um, if you're constructing Chinese characters, they're constructed of things called radicals. Um, and there are 100, 200 radicals, which kind of carry meaning in themselves. They're like, little elemental symbols that make up the characters and um what it means is that this kind of lexical structure means that you can kind of quite easily see some metaphorical reference to the physical world so so for example the the word or the character ju means intelligence in chinese but it's composed of the radicals for um arrow mouth and sun so or let's say sun, arrow, mouth. 
that that make the, the, those little pictograms make up the 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 kanji uh, the yes for intelligence okay and you know the sun you know kind of looks like a sun the mouth kind of looks like a mouth so there's this there's this metaphorical reference to like the physical world in a very obvious way mm -hmm. that you don't get in a in a term like intelligence um and what's just really really interesting when we when we talk about language is that we're, we're talking about language from the perspective of the language that we speak you know the kind of patterns and, and the norms of our sort of native language which is really full of um biases you know mm. um like so so one of the so one example that i i i give for english of linguistic bias is the suffix ness so if you talk about like happiness mm. or like sadness um it's actually from uh, Anglo-Saxon, but you, you get it in Spanish as well. So like um, dad, like felicidad, or like esa, tristeza. Mm -hmm. But but anyway, w w so like happiness, sadness, goodness, truthfulness, this -ness, it kind of allows, um, it, it allows concepts to be decontextualized from their kind of material experiential kind of instances. It makes abstraction really accessible. Mm. Um, you know, all of a sudden we can talk about like goodness or truthfulness as this like standalone concept apart from any sort of story. Mm -hmm. um, and this uh, apparently really did it really did emerge with the Greeks this this habit of categorizing according to these abstractable the attributes. Yeah. yeah, and it and it. I don't want to say it forces you into this kind of platonic ideals style of vision. Um, you know, yeah, sure, it doesn't force you, but it certainly like predisposes your attention to think that goodness and badness and sadness are like things that exist apart from apart from us, right? Mm -hmm. And disrupting this is really, really difficult. Um, you know, like. It, the 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 weight of those thousands of years of like philosophy it, it doesn't it doesn't easily go away mm. and we don't really have an alternative um so that's kind of like how how we assume the the world is you know that that these things like goodness sadness exist apart from us um but then you know if 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 you look at say so like intelligence in Chinese and like how how that's sort of metaphorically rendered in reference to the elements it, it's just a bit of a different it's a bit of a different relationship with language mm. um and it's something that's really hard it's really hard to teach it's really hard to communicate because you're communicating in the thing that you're communicating about um, but I think it's incredibly important especially when it comes to talking about like um transforming worldviews or integrating alternative like visions alternative states of consciousness um it, it's it's so important yeah yeah and that's we can we can onboard the idea of of what you and i were talking off 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 record or off camera whatever it was about frame breaking and how psychedelics have really just shattered um our ability in our indo-european tree we'll forget this what's that mm -hmm. sino i forget the there's the, what's the other language tree that 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 chinese is in it's a sino something language tree. but yeah for, i know x <laughs> we'll we'll stick with not the... proto indo european just, just the other one yeah yeah i, I actually can't remember the name yeah, I, I, there's like three language trees and there's one tiny one and then there's the Sino something and then there's our Indo-European and uh, damned if I can remember. But anyway, uh, in our in our sphere, our, our place with uh, us English speakers and, and all the other languages that go with it, though, that psychedelics and, and perhaps this translates over into that other language tree. But yeah, let's talk about that idea that you you get to this point where you have an experience, you perceive something. Uh, 
and it is a valid perception in my opinion because it's all it's all the same processes going on it's just different configurations of neuropeptides or whatever you want to call it that facilitate that um language is evolutionary we're 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 in this space right now where more than a handful of people are having these experiences they're into this new terrain or ecology of experience so talk to us about um you know what 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 psychedelics are doing for language and semantics or if they are doing right. anything <laughs> what's the need to do maybe <laughs> oh, it, well it, um i i just want to add something to what to, to to what you said you know of, of course there are there are um you know these these language trees that many of the languages spoken in the world you know come from um but there are also um hundreds maybe actually thousands of like language isolates where they they mm. can't like i i think there's the three in europe i think maybe 40 in um, the usa you know what kind of language is, is developed and it doesn't really refer to anything to anything around it and and and, the, and those and those are fascinating those are really fascinating um you know because cause some of the things that you uh, take for granted or think might be universal just aren't universal mm. you know you think the colors might be universal you know no no mm. Mm. um so so that's so, so, so that but let's just sort of um shelve that for now and and then and then <laughs> think about this and and think about the trouble that english speakers let's say that the, the trouble that we have with um psychedelic explanations um so i'm not disputing i'm not disputing that psychedelics are incompatible with the patterns of english like i i think i think it is really incompatible but i don't think it's um i think this idea that lang that psychedelics and psychedelic experiences are somehow beyond language i think that makes us lazy with mm. with language and what became very clear to me was that the um you know the indigenous cultures that have been using these tools these compounds for thousands of years they're not they're not going like oh this is like this is beyond words this is yeah. that you know they have these really just complex taxonomical like systems of understanding um these experiences okay um so so to then to then sort of get too wrapped up in this like this is ineffable all it does is that um we sort of end up falling back on these really standard metaphors like you know the sort of neurological reset the brain reset um ooh, and that will sort of dominate our idea of what psychedelics do and i mean this is a whole other thing but you know like do, because of the way that the the media works um it, it it allows a space where like one metaphor can become like the absolute dominant way of understanding mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. um and doesn't leave much space for other um I'm, I'm 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 combining a lot of things into into one here and just <laughs> It's just such a rabbit hole. It's such a rabbit hole. <laughs> we'll we'll get a nice ladder to climb down the rabbit so we don't go falling. <laughs> Speaking of metaphors. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 you speak to something there where like I, I I like philosophy of mind and cognitive science and and psychology. I'm not that I know anything about it, but I just like listening to people talk about it. And it seems like scientism materialism physicalism loves this sort of language of its own and it's it's um, uh, underpinnings and presuppositions and and metaphysical assumptions that that build the dialogue and the narrative of um, what is consciousness and what is uh, you know neuroscience and cognitive science and it's not you know it's not a totality of of the conversation but you can distinguish between different schools and different camps of thinking. And I'm trying to make this map onto what you're saying that 
that we find ourselves in tribes or in groups or whatever when we have these conversations about let's just say philosophy of mind or something and and some people will come at it here you got the iit people and and uh, uh, uh right. illusionists and and eliminativists and then you have people who are out there like what, people that i like you know we're doing other things <laughs> right right so, so if that so speaks see- to what you're saying because let's see let's say you're like operating within a language where like the mind and the body are very clearly distinguished um you know that that it 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 just it just makes you naturally lean into a, a particular way of seeing the world and then um so that i i i love Alfred North whitehead mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that whole kind of like panpsychism school and what what I found really really interesting about those guys particularly particularly Whitehead was that he realized that in order to express um a sort of different philosophy like he had to invent a different language yeah because all of the words that you might use in philosophy like you know subject and object come with these connotations and you know all of his work it, it's it's really like playing with the fact that like he can't really use the word subject because that like, yes while he's talking about subjects and objects he's not using those words in the way that um in the way that we're speakers of english are going to think about them naturally yeah we've been conditioned so, to think about <laughs> yeah so you're kind of you're kind of um he sort of like whisks you away on this so stepping stone process of being like, okay, so I'm going to use the word subject for now, but mm-hmm. um, this isn't how I mean it. So now I'm going to replace that with the word superject, but mm-hmm. I'm only going to use like this word superject. You know, it's like this like stepping yeah. stone of introducing you to these like new words. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is why it's quite difficult to sort of summarize um, any of these ideas and make them kind of accessible you know, in a way that you would typically um, speak, I can't put this, you know, we, we, we have this sort of idea of like what good communication and what like good teaching is. And, and um, it's just really impossible to do if you're talking about a philosophical system that doesn't align with the, the orthodoxies of the language that you're yeah. speaking. Mm-hmm. And y- you, you just, you have to, you have to, diverge from that and it it becomes sort of less marketable because you're not following particular conventions so it's like oh so so it's sort of like all all these things get kind of tied up within each other like um you know so what gets what gets promoted what gets distributed um is not particularly interesting philosophically yeah because you'd have to diverge from language norms which means you'd have to diverge from um epistemic uh, you know, kind, the kind of, of yeah the sort yeah. of like typical hooks yeah so i mean i really really just like i really commend what you're what you're doing because it's really really not easy but it's so necessary if we're going to talk about like transformation or like hope for any kind of social or cultural or any kind of change um these sort of like these deeper philosophies have to shift and these and some language patterns have to shift alongside alongside those so you know like all respect to you for oh well to my guests philosophy my guests like you yeah i mean and 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 you're saying that when you speak, I get these you know, these thought cl- clap bubbles that pop up in my head, and it's like um, language does evolve and it changes and it moves kind of in a forward linear direction. And what I was getting out of what you were saying that is that there's the pop culture, there's um, trendiness and new phrases, and the youth culture develops because they have to be distinct from the other culture, the older generation or whatever. Uh, there's that, but then there's also like this kind of glacial or, or 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 some sort of other that we've been that you've spoken to and that I kind of brought up with uh, with different camps of philosophy of mind or whatever is that that there has to be this uh, concrescence if we'll use a Whiteheadian term where this is sort of con- cohering of 
a consensual um, movement forward in in terms and and that is a hard fought hard won uh, process I would think yeah and, and and White has such a perfect example he uses all these really what I initially found to be very abstruse very difficult uh, language and then I just learned like any other yeah. language to just interpret and say oh oh so I can use three of these words to mean uh, you know what actual occasion might be or or concrescence yeah. or yeah yeah so so um, so the two are probably distinct from one another. There's pop culture and, you know, f you know, funny aphorisms and words coming out of that. But the, but but um, there's also this what we're interested in um, is it's, it's yes. autogenesis is um, quite distinct, I think. Yeah, but 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 I think I think the commonality there is this like playfulness, it is mm. willingness to be playful with language and to sort of recognize that that. Um, categories can be recategorized, um, I, I, I suppose, and and it's something that I think is much easier for sort of bilinguals to understand than monolinguals. You know, it, you know, it, even if you know, even if you're really, really bad at the language that you're you, that you're like trying to learn, if if you have, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, it it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I think just just as long as you like understand the biases of your own language and what might be more expressible in in another language, you know, mm -hmm. even though you're having to frame that with your native language, and you you're obviously not fully getting the nuances. Mm -hmm. Just understanding that there is this alternative like categorization system, it, it like that's really really powerful, and that's. It, it's such a good antidote to dogma, you know, because because as soon as you get this kind of like ambiguity, like dogma falls apart. And 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 I and I kind of and I see these, I I see ambiguity and and and, and poetry is is a really good kind of antidote to 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 to, to dogma. Mm. Um. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. No, because that's language at play. That's language being romantic. It's 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 you, you're yeah. letting you're kind of you're overseeing the language, but you're not, um, you know, in order yeah. to to communicate that way, the language is in a more a parody with you in that creation process, whereas somebody who's doing something more mundane is just it's you know like writing an instruction manual <laughs> it's just you're you're the commander of the language and you're putting down the instructions for how to fix a widget or whatever but when you're doing poetry there's it's uh um, yeah it's it's oh what is it um i was i was using this really elegant thing yesterday where um you enter into oh shit i can't remember the words i used but it was, i was on fire yesterday and i had this really neat thing and and it's 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 basically right relation. Like you're entering into, um, you're submitting to the language, and the language is submitting to you. Whereas you're not dominating the language, and it's purely submission on its end. It's it's that you know you're conforming. Right. That's it. You're conforming to each other, and uh, that's yeah. kind of verbaki language. But it is this auto. It's this reciprocal conforming in language in yeah. in poet in poetry. I, it, it, that's just me riffing, but yeah. Yeah, and 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 it's not that, and it's not that one use of language is or, or one way of seeing is better than the other you, you know so for example like in in, in science <clears throat> you don't want linguistic ambiguity mm -hmm. you know and that's mm -hmm. that that's the point of you know naming things um you sort of, um what is it binomial, Tax, tax. Binomial yeah, taxonomy. Yeah. yeah yeah like you 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 want as little ambiguity as possible you want your sort of categories in in your research to be as yeah. um rigid and so yeah as rigid as rigid as possible so that you can make predictions mm -hmm. which is cool yeah. which is great like you yeah. you can't it would be a hot mess otherwise. it would be a, it would be a hot mess if if <laughs> if the zoologists would just like fighting about what zebras are um mm -hmm. which there is some which i believe there is, is some, there some argumentation there, there is some argument but if yeah. that's all they argued about nightmare yeah, I follow um, I follow botany, and it's funny because of of genetic sequencing. Um, thirty, almost thirty years ago, there was a treatise written on uh, a taxa of palms in Madagascar, and they lumped everything together. Everything became this one genus, okay. and and just last year, the same people that wrote that 
uh, treaties or that that monograph or the paper or whatever you know for the literature they split everything out again it was almost falling back out on the lines and that they lumped in 95 because i love botany and horticulture and so and they brought everything back out of dipsis into you know uh, all the other like three species or four species that, so so yeah i, I just use that as an example yeah. zebras and... yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but 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 that that's that's but it, so it, it's the it's the capacity like you know to be able to recognize and just using that example to recognize the natural world on that level on that nuanced level but also see that 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 is something that that's a system that's being imposed from our particular perspective mm -hmm. and and then you know understand that there are other uses of of language of language which i i think we've kind of fallen out of touch with um and i don't know if you know david abram um so philosopher this is the eco philosopher um this fantastic book called wrote this fantastic book called the spell of the sensuous mm. and you know he's you know he's he, you know he's he's he, he wants people to appreciate nature and, and he's coming at that. And he, he has this idea that um, basically literacy um, has disconnected us from the world. But anyway, mm. um, one of the points that he, that he makes is that um, sort of spiritual scripture used to be a lot more ambiguous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so in the kind of ancient Hebrew alphabet, um, it didn't have, letters for what we have come to call vowels so basically like reading ancient hebrew required a lot more kind of contextual inference mm -hmm. um and that all these kind of ancient semitic languages shared this structure so they're kind of incomplete the sort of spiritual scriptures they're incomplete um you know so like if you're a priest giving sermons three thousand years ago there's a lot more like a lot more of your job is interpretation um, because that the meaning isn't as fixed. So you've got this multiplicity within the text, just like poetry, just like you would have in poetry now. Right. Whereas that when you get to this kind of more prosaic language, um, it, 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 that, that kind of allows these kind of meanings to be a little bit more embalmed into sort of creeds. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm propositional and it, yeah and it, yeah and it just it just it changes the way that sort of religion and spirituality is is practiced where it's um you know from this kind of like uncertainty this kind of poetic um interaction i suppose mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah oh go ahead sorry yeah no no, to, to, to... <laughs> no i was going to riff <laughs> on what you were that. saying that like here in the 21st century we're taking uh iron age and an axial age allegory and we run it through the enlightenment project where empiricism and rationality and, and uh, uh what is it um what was august Comte? logical positivism all this kind of stuff and so here we find ourselves in the 21st century again trying to reify these very abstract and nebulous spiritual yeah. concepts and yeah, boom, you know, it's like a big yeah. shit bomb that goes off. Yeah. And but that's been slowly developing prior to the Enlightenment project where uh dogma and uh manipulation and control of people, et cetera, et cetera. I won't get too much on the soapbox about that. But yeah, I I I know to what you speak, and it's if we could rediscover or how re um appropriate that thinking to spirituality. Oh man, you know, <laughs> just kind of yeah. and there are people yeah. doing it, right? There are people yeah. Doing it. And and that and that's and you know so 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 after I after I finished my PhD which I don't think I mentioned yet but you know I sort of wrote wrote a, a PhD on 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 all of this and um, you know I suppose like what what you're told throughout your PhD is that um, you know just get it finished no one's going to read it <laughs> and it really, um, and. And as I kind of got to the end of this process, I was really increasingly feeling like, like, you know, actually, like, I really, really do feel that this, some of this is important. And I'm just constantly trying to find ways to, I, I, I suppose, to sort of educate, educate people in interesting ways about how interesting language 
is and you know just get people to think more critically um about about language and this is this this process that i'm in right now well um i sort of run an organization um with um my good friend and colleague rosalind stone called this called semantrics mm-hmm. um where we're just really running courses um just trying to help people understand what language really is and and you know to, just to really get down to those sort of like like foundations of of metaphors mm. um because it's just it's at the heart of all meaning making and yeah this this is my this is my real sort of concern at the minute is is you know how how can we make changes in ourselves socially environmentally if we don't really understand the sort of biases that we're sort of playing out every single in every single moment with every mm-hmm. single utterance mm-hmm. um Yeah, we presuppose so much when we communicate, I think. And I don't say that judgmentally. I mean, we all do it, but there's, yeah, it's, I, I, so maybe we're taking for granted the um, perceptual subjectivity or perceptual bias, however that might come out um, in in communication. It's it's there, but, you know, we may, we may not... Uh, granted that status when we're speaking in other words we we think yeah. we're being pretty straight one-to-one mapping of of what we're communicating but as you said there's a perceptual um ecosystem or, or ecology or whatever there that you know has to be accounted for the perception of things yeah and, I, and... I, I, yeah I, I mean i can i can i can give you an example that might be sort of yeah helpful um so like i was on the i was on the phone to um a friend of mine that this 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 was last year and just to set the scene she's this like lightning smart wonder woman she lives in new york like, runs her own business um she's got like, four kids and she like a divorce had finally gone through and she was like really happy because she'd been with this like dogmatic religious guy who you know yeah <laughs> Enough like, said. <laughs> like, yeah, despite not having a job, like couldn't manage to make dinner for his children or get into school on time. But anyway, so she's sort of coming out of this like oppressive, pretty traumatizing situation. And she went to her first like mushroom ceremony. Mm-hmm. And like, like she'd never done a drug, so to speak, in her life, but she's given, you know, four grams of Ooh. mushrooms on this beach in Mexico with very little preparation and kind of left to it, which is a mm-hmm. That's very harsh. very common thing so it's a very common thing yeah right. yeah um <clears throat> and shock her i mean she had a horrendous time i'm sure i'm sure absolutely four grams is way too much on your first experience <laughs> anyway and and, and, and yeah she, she she knows that i work in this world and, and she called me and she's describing you know uncovering memories that have been like filed away or locked away like a long time ago so I'm listening and at the end of this I said like hey did you notice the metaphor that you were using there you know the metaphor that you're using for your memories um you know she got it straight away and she's really she's really sharp and she was like oh my god I think of my memories like a filing cabinet like Jesus <laughs> um I'm like yeah but you know don't worry that's really deeply engraved in the English language and and, and but what I found really beautiful she's like no 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 but like I know where I got that. She's like, when I was like four, I saw this episode of the like the Muppets. I think it might have been like Muppet Babies. And Kermit loses a memory and they go inside his brain to look for it and it's full of filing cabinets. <laughs> and she's like, oh my God, does my like main model of memory come from the Muppets? Like Muppet Babies? <laughs> and I'm like, kind of. I'm like, not, not that the Muppets are to blame. Um, no. And I haven't seen this episode. Like I don't know. Yeah. Like, I don't know. But like, but like that, and it's not the Muppets, certainly not the Muppets' fault. But that's that is like a very that's a that's our like principal metaphor for memory. Yeah. yeah. Um, w- w- where it is like we, it's like these like units of data that are like 
lot to weigh and in real in reality we have absolutely no idea what memories are like yeah that there isn't like a place in the brain that they we have no idea no it's all metaphor yeah so then like the metaphor that's that we're using to like narrate that becomes the, the thing like it's not it, it's not separate from the experience of having a memory mm. um and then like as soon as you really understand that and understand like all the different ways where all the different iterations of that that come up in in your sort of daily speech it just gives you a lot more sovereignty to be able to be like hang on a minute like like what if i don't imagine it like if i'm kind of what if i um what if i create this like system of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, you know? like a reverse engineering or retro engineering of, yeah. of the yeah. concept so, yeah yeah so like, okay so what if these aren't like memories that i'm retrieving what if this is just like a new story that i'm telling each time and you know which, mm. which um probably is more accurate yeah it's iterative accurate perhaps. To what's actually what what's happening with that we're just like storytelling and we're like yeah based on you know, like we've we've all had it where we've, you know, something's happened and then we we get used to telling that story of what's happened, and then after a while we're like actually not sure what really happened anymore because this sort of this 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 narrative has it's sort of taken the place of the memory, right? Yeah, I I have a kind of adjacent example to that it's it's not a direct correlation but when I was an infant this is going to sound really ludicrous but when I was an infant I was in my bassinet or pram or whatever the hell it was I was contained in something and and I was less than a year old and I remember two faces coming down and babbling at me like women do not to pick on women but they were two women they were babbling baby talk at me and oh, you know you know you know doing that kind of baby thing and I can remember, and this is probably, as you just pointed out, it is it is multiply iterative recollection. But mm -hmm. in that instance, and I impose language on it later, I remember thinking to myself, I don't understand their language. This is not the language that I know. Or yeah. this is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so I'm putting English into this, but yeah. they were they were speaking English to me. But as the infant, I was looking yes. up at these two faces and I said, I, I, I again, this is multiple iterations of recall but i remember distinctly because it's just been that impactful in my life that it stuck with me and that that i had that interior thought that self reflective thought that this is not my language this is not what i understand but to have that capacity at at, at less than it you know probably nine months to 14 months somewhere in that range uh still a just helpless little baby and again, I imposed everything else on it as recall, but <laughs> no, but no, but do, do do you remember like, I, 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 I have quite vivid memories from being a child and listening to adult conversations and having these gaps of understanding, right? You know, sort of <laughs> where like you, it it where it, where it almost like w w when I was sort of learning Spanish and I could maybe understand like half of what was going on mm -hmm. I kept having these almost like flashbacks to being to being a child and listening mm. to adults speaking and having this uh, re like real like familiarity um you know but only when I was kind of immersed in Spanish you know not when you're you're in a class trying to learn it from this kind of book right and um but that really I think I'm going on a tangent now but that really sort of affected the the way I think about things like pedagogically you mm -hmm. know um, and and again I, I I think teachers are sort of like uh, encouraged to like walk people through things very very slowly and make sure that everybody you know understands everything and, and I actually don't agree with that at all I think I think actually like how people are more likely to pay attention is if they don't quite understand what's completely what's happening. Mm -hmm. I think that is more of an incentive to, to actually keep listening and keep trying to build up that picture. Yeah. The, the fear of being left behind. Like, 
yeah than if you're kind of walk through something in this like linear fashion that that's how I learn I, I don't no know. I I think in the way I learn things I agree because you don't want to get left behind or you're or you're you're feeling you know you're in a social system in a classroom or whatever and if all the other kids get it and you're sitting there going so that might incentivize yeah. you to yeah to, to 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 pick that up or or to go beyond uh whatever level you might be trying to to learn to uh, to pick it up so yeah i agree i agree or a mix you know where you can you know yeah. hand, hand hold for a while and then just cut loose because like i was telling you about this job i have and i'll uh usually i eat my lunch out in the field i do uh, i i work in an agriculture position and, and we're out in the field all the time but sometimes we're in the uh, office and we're in the break room and again everybody's speaking spanish and i understand about 30 percent of what's being said and the other 60 70 percent depending on where I'm at, uh, is a mystery because they're speaking yeah. very fast and they're speaking in, yeah. in in a dialect. And so, but I love it because I'm like, yes. a word will pop out and I'm like, oh, I might no. onboard that word today. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> or, that, but that's, that, that's, that that's the word. And, and, and I think that's the problem with a lot of language learning. People will sort of hit a word that they don't know and then kind of, kind of give up. Like, oh, I don't understand what's happening. Yeah. But, you know, when we're learning languages, children we you know we wouldn't we wouldn't just like hit a word in a sentence and then like decide that we don't know it and then like it's just like give fall up back to our communication what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. can't fall back you know? <laughs> no. yeah. uh, so true now this yeah. is this is close uh the question i have for you um and and we actually we've we've gone past an hour time just goes by when we're and and to our credit, we have not gone off on any wild tangents. We both settled it. We were yeah. speaking off camera or before record. Yeah, we'd have to restrain ourselves. But I think not to be congratulatory just yet, but I think we've done a good job. But I do have, uh, and of course, I want you to come back and I want to have uh, more conversation with you. But I think we'll give we'll leave the audience with this. But I did have one, something I thought of yesterday um, that relates to maybe your field of work and where we've been in this conversation. And that is, um, during the, I, I was listening to a lecture and I guess during the axial age, there were less self other reference, uh, in that period. And maybe it was the Semitic, lang Semitic languages. Uh, I, I believe it was, you know, in that region. And so the self other referent, uh, was less utilized or, or the concept of a self was less important. And so the, all the, you know, I, thou pronoun kind of things going on were, were less meaningful. And we've certainly gone in, in the modern West to a hard, hard identity on, you know, like the Beatles, I, me, mine, I, me, mine, I, me, mine. And, and now with the psychedelic renaissance underway, and we find, um, again, language fails, but we find ourselves in a kind of non-dual uh, paradigm, uh, you know, a, a means of dissolving a self-boundary. Um, I wonder what that looks, what that might look like for future language evolution when we you know, so you talked about a superject earlier and uh, Verveke, John Verveke talks about a transject, like a non-subject, non-object. And and that's close to where I'm heading, but like the the I, the sense of the I-ness and the sense of the you-ness and the they-ness. Um, I don't expect it to become ambiguous or hybridized or synthesized in any way, but I'm just curious, like what you might think about um as more of us might find ourselves dissolving boundaries of identity and perceptual, uh, you know, normatives of of selves and others. What do you think about well, you know, I or... <laughs> Honestly, honestly, and I, I, I've never thought about this question in the way, in the way that you, in exactly the way that you've posed it before, but I think it should dissolve mm. and not in the way that it's, concretizing around um your know, particular pronouns and people wanting to be I, I i really don't want to go down that rabbit hole but this mm -hmm. sort of you know people getting really really upset about very particular identity pronouns. markers yeah. i do not think that that is the way to go i think that like the more flexibility that we can all have in that realm um the the easier it's going to be to adapt to um to different worldviews that we need to adapt to and you know the, there's some really good writers on on this you know uh tyson Junker porter um uh, who wrote sand talk like he's 
um he's from a sort of aboriginal australian background and, and he talks about the pronouns that he grew up with being uh quite different you know because there was the sort of um uh, like plural first person you know you'd, you'd have we like us two or we like um the, the group um and another and another writer is nicholas nicholas evans who wrote dying words who, who just talked about different you know sort of indigenous languages more often than not who have different different sort of pronoun categories and and again like you you, you don't even have to adopt them but just knowing like like knowing that those exist it just really it's just that kind of loosens you up and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um because you, you you know like i and i i don't speak any ind- indigenous languages i'd, I'd love to i would I'd, I'd love to spend some time on that when, when i have time to do that um but just as like a first just as like a first step of just like understanding the biases of your own like pronouns your own grammar yeah just yeah. just 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 knowing about what your language doesn't have is powerful is really powerful yeah i always say i and me with a grain of salt you know <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah 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 like, because yeah. I interviewed this uh, and I I just, I'm evangelizing at this point for this guy, but Mike Levin, who's a biologist, he's a developmental biologist at Tufts. And he talks about um, uh, a scale invariant swarm intelligence, you know, is kind of his, his jargon for it, but it's, it's basically uh, almost like the philosophical uh, uh, Indra's net kind of thing, or the Buddhist interdependence. It's, it's that cellularity is everywhere. Cellularity is, is a system. And so our liver is a union of cells and every cell had best, cohere to the other cell and relate to it in accordance with what is appropriate for that morphology of a, of a liver, lest they succumb to a disease. And, and I use that as a metaphor for the species as a human race, that when we go into this, I, me distinction and you and they and others, you know, that that's a, that's an excuse that, yeah. that starts division. So like botany earlier, there's lumpers and splitters, like they, they, they split everything or they lumped everything into dipsis and they split everything back out again. And so it's that lumping splitting thing uh, in this kind of thinking with the pronouns with the, I, me, you, they, them, yeah. other, you know, and if we can dissolve that distinction to say, no, you know, this is all one species. We're a monotypic species. <laughs> and yeah, respect yeah. that <laughs> yeah yeah and and but you you're never gonna you're never gonna dissolve it fully not no not and it's you, you know, yeah there have to be bound there has to be, like the markov yeah. blanket thing yeah, there has to be boundaries there yes we yeah. are distinguishable but like if you asked me like at, at the beginning of this of this conversation you know like what like what why are you here what are you what do you do and i said you know i'm a I'm a philosopher of language. You know, that sounds so weird to me. I am a philosopher, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's necessary, like, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, what I'm really saying is, you know, like I philosophize about language, but like the the norm is to say I am. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know. I am X, you know. <laughs> I, I, I am X. And, y- you know, I could absolutely insist on not saying that because I don't think that's a good linguistic structure. But... Also, if you want to challenge people's language, that you you can't like you can't like tell people that like the way they're saying things is wrong. Right? That's not like, the way. Yeah, that's yeah. no one's gonna think, no one's gonna like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It has to be consensual. <laughs> it has to be again yeah. this 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 default altruism, this default uh, cohering of of um, yeah. importance or whatever, or com- whatever yeah. it is. Whatever. What do the hippies say? Uh, um, Oh, coexist, right? The tag, the yeah. bumper sticker. You know, it has to be that no, kind that of thing. But it's not yeah. as cheesy as that. But you know, <laughs> like, like you, you have to, you have to be understand. You have to be cliche and understandable and familiar yeah. before you then start to sort of <laughs> play with that. Like you, you can't, you, you can't just dive in with some like alternative language. It's just, it's just no one's gonna care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know it's gonna like you. 
<laughs> and it, once again, you don't want to be a bad liver cell. You want to be a good yeah. liver cell. Yeah, yeah. You want to live with your neighbors. Yeah. yeah. No, no. And and I, and I, and I was just like, uh, as you as you were describing sort of Michael Levin's view, I was thinking like, okay, so it's like a a liver that's like having an identity crisis about whether or not it's a liver, and that's yeah. and then that's actually just like not allowing it to function. Um, <laughs> I could see our livers reading uh, Sartre and, and, and the French existentialists. I, I don't want my liver to read any French existentialism. It's, Mid-century French existentialism. It's doing fine. No, no, no. It's doing... Yeah, we need unitary, unifying project. Yeah. <laughs> but like, but as you say, like, obviously, like, humans are not doing fine within, like, a larger system and um, perhaps some kind of existential crisis that, transforms us into a different relationship with the system which i think has to include language is mm -hmm. it's going to be it's going to be necessary and um well i certainly don't have the answers but i do have a sense of what's obstructing um what might be obstructing that kind of flexibility does that go back to the referent of of I and me, or? Well, just just understanding like linguistic, and understanding mm. linguistic bias that like mm. whatever sort of native language you're existing within okay. has a particular um, philosophical perspective, um, you know, has a particular bias, mm. and um, given that existence is a complete mystery that we actually really don't but we actually don't really know mm -hmm. what life is let alone what death is <laughs> <laughs> yet we bring so much hubris to the table when we, we try to define so it much, yeah. yes. i know the answer <laughs> Boom, 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 yes. boom. Listen to me, <laughs> me, given, I. <laughs> given, given that we know very, very little, I think it's just really <laughs> useful to understand what our biases are um, when it comes to that little that we might know. Yeah, uh, yeah. God, this is depressing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we're at, well. No, I think we're ending on an appropriate note. I mean, I, 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 I say ending because we're probably about an hour and twenty in, and we agreed we would keep this one a little bit shorter, and we can always have you back for another conversation, but. Maybe it's necessary to end on a note that's not uh, rosy because um, much like you said in learning a new language, should the teacher, uh, you know, walk us through it quickly or should she throw us in the water and teach us to swim, you know, accordingly by our own uh, means? I don't know. You know, I, I, I and, and, you know, the viewers who are still watching, you're welcome to comment and, and input in the in the comments of uh, the YouTube the section down there where you can comment. So, but yeah, I mean. No, I think you're right. I think it is a necessary existential uh, mountain that we need to crash our plane into. If you want to keep milking metaphors <laughs> that, you know, it, it'll break frame, right? We were joking about breaking yeah. frame when we first met. And it's like, uh, this is a good, it's not a good frame break because a lot of people could lose their lives or a lot of people could be thrust into, you know, abject misery or whatever. But those those who might make it through and the irony i think is if if western modern blah 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 collapses that the un uh what we would call neolithic cultures tribal cultures and things uh, you know they'll be all right as long as we don't irradiate the, the entire planet with nuclear weapons i mean I, they'll, they'll be fine they're they've been for 12 15 thousand years been kind of churning along yeah, yeah. and they have a system yeah. and it's very yeah. simple and it works and there's something to be said for simplicity complexity can work Dave Snowden's a good complexity scientist, and he admits that you can't you can't upscale um, like management and governance and things like that. It just doesn't work. You get to a tipping point at around three million people, and we've been thrust into a collective in communication and and market systems and even governance. And it's just we're struggling with that. We're trying to figure that out. So, and I don't have an answer, and I don't think anybody does. I, <laughs> <laughs> has to reveal itself naturally i think yeah. or yeah. by by complete collapse and <laughs> note taking i don't it know it seems easy it seems easier to go back smaller again when it did work yeah. than try yeah. and figure it out <laughs> yeah yeah or just in a um positive 
valent positive affect to use those psychological terms means of of again encapsulating ourselves into into manageable communities but then nonetheless have respect for the other communities so we don't get in group biases and and pointing at those people and saying they're not as good as we are or they're you know blah 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 they're primitive or whatever so if we could if we scale back in that regard and and still have that and that goes to the liver analogy you know they're still our companion cells and if we don't get along with those companion cells we'll get that cancer or that autoimmune condition that will just wipe us all off the planet you know so we could say to be continued perhaps <laughs> in another conversation although that's not our charge i think our charge here is to talk language uh perception meaning things yeah. like that so we'll stay away yeah, from, yeah, from but, solving because the world. because also also <laughs> you know um it, it can really enrich your it can really enrich your world as well which is, is what i've experienced for you know you you um uh, learn about the sort of concepts that exist in other languages apart from your own and it actually enriches your it actually yeah. enriches your world so it's yeah. not all doom yeah no I, unless I, you want it to be yeah yeah I, I I am somewhat optimistic uh you know I I've reached my midlife and so I look to the younger generations and I see glimmers of hope in in your generation and maybe the ones that are coming on now the Z's that they'll just look at what's transpired in the last maybe 100 years and just shake their heads and go this isn't really working you know maybe, maybe we can think of new ways and i and your generation is is rethinking the market systems and enterprise in novel ways and more egalitarian ways and more of that uh, uh, cellular cooperation kind of way and i and that to me to me, I like that because previous generations were all about linear hierarchy, caste systems, feudal. You know, I don't think the feudal age ever died. They say it died in the 16th century, but it just it reshaped itself into other things. And it's just moving along. And, I, and that's very uh, polemic of me to say that. But I almost think that we could shake some of more of that casty kind of thing. Out of there. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? No, like that... the, it's all abstract, you know? <laughs> no, and, and that I mean, that's that's why it's worthy to challenge the the way that academia works as well and mm, yeah and you know whether the most radical and valuable ideas are, are coming from outside academia right now i'm not i'm you know whether they are or they aren't i, I don't know Let, mm -hmm. let's not get into that but yeah <laughs> Well, it could be mutual affordances, you know, I mean, academia could look out from its window and say, oh, cool, what's going on over there? And then the people who are, you know, anarchistically yeah. uh, socially doing things, you know, they could learn from academia. You know? And it's not and all I, anarchy. I, it's not all yeah, anarchy. No, and, I, and, I, and I, I actually think that's a really good way of putting it. And I think that is like when things, you know, when you get people you know, when you get people like from within the academy looking at just in the example of psychedelics like looking at people like kind of Dennis McKenna or like mm -hmm. Sasha Shulgin and Anne Shulgin like looking at those people who are just outside the academy and going like yeah 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 <laughs> something there. yeah it's fodder it's it's new material to work with instead of yeah. the stodgy old <laughs> recycling yeah. of ideas you're getting that's the Bayesian calculus right you're just bringing in a new yeah. you're updating your priors by putting something new on board yeah. which I'm all for which is why I love that again the the huge conversation going on over in Phil of Mind and Cogsci and psychology and materialism versus panpsychism versus this versus that it is a giant Hegelian dialect and it's it's like uh what's going to come out of that I, I you know what, what what can we synthesize out of all of that and and bring that into the fold and that will influence a lot of other branches of, of you know how we do things like science different yeah. disciplines within science and 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 then that will trickle down to to the general audience to the to the average person because right now the spokespeople of science drive me insane you know it's like they like the Richard Dawkins and Neil deGrasse Tysons of the world, they, they, you know, they want to stake claim on a, on a tiny, tiny little parcel of land in this in infinite universe. And they think these are all the answers are all going to come from this one, you know, quanta of space and you right. know evidence but, and things. It's like, stop. Yeah. <laughs> They're just trying to sell books. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and like certainty, certainty pays, right? Like, oh yeah. 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 You know, because we that... want to be comforted by the fact that this, and this yeah. goes back to the feudal system. It's like the Lord has spoken. The Lord of the manor yeah. has spoken. And yeah. these spokespeople of whatever, scientism or whatever, have spoken. And, oh, I feel so much better. Even though they just delivered nihilism yes. to me, I feel yeah. better. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's on, 
honestly. And ironically, I feel quite certain in saying that like that's not going to get us very far. No, no, because the whole point of science is, yeah, it's agnosticism and it's it's trying to prove yourself wrong. And that's the whole point of science. And then you get the spokespeople of science going, I have all the answers and I'm going to lord over you and you're going to feel good about it because you're going to live vicariously through me because I'm an authority figure. And I want to invoke the appeal to authority fallacy now (laughs) and all these things. And I see that and I just go mad. I'm like, oh, God. And it can go in any direction. I mean, somebody with a really great idea, you know, like someone in panpsychism or idealism or whatever could do the same thing yeah. and, and manipulate people and get money from them. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So For me, and I think I think the best I think the best thing that we can do. And I, and I always think of this in kind of like musical metaphors, you know, is just like be able to change key. Mm. You know, if if it. it if we're like you know if if we're listening to like a different idea or we're like or like or we've altered our perception or we'll just like be able to modulate be able to like modulate try different belief systems try mm-hmm. different like language patterns um like I, I just I just think that kind of flexibility I mean some like diversity in our belief systems some diversity in our language some diversity in our sort of perceptual world Mm -hmm. i think that's the the best hope we have of um sanity yeah yeah survival (laughs) moving forward yeah yeah whatever whatever that's whatever sanity is we you know we aspire to it (laughs) yeah um and that's why I'm always sort of a tongue in cheek. I love that Peronian skepticism and the tagline of epoche leads to ataraxia, like a suspension of judgment leads to a well, a sense of well-being. You know, that yeah. that for me is is you know, I could get I could get by on that bread alone. You know, yeah, <laughs> just to, just it's, but it's hard. Judgment. It's it's not. It it's, is it's not yeah. easy. It's not. Oh yeah, it's not, it's not comfortable. No, because as much as I joke about that, I have my my beliefs and dogmas, and I work on them a lot to try to be that kind of open antenna like you said i can change octaves and scales with people and 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 be in that resonance with them and and yeah it coexist again as as it were with them be the good liver cell (laughs) no no, like like i i you know i i try as much as i can to like not be a bit of a panpsychist you know that's my kind of natural Mm-hmm. bent i suppose towards mm-hmm. a sort of panpsychist view yeah. and i and i and i try not to do that all the time yeah but it's hard it's really hard yeah yeah well it's a good you know it's it's a you could either call it a useful fiction or what i would call a um uh, a useful utility or a, a working utility that that it's flexible it is subject to change when when yeah. we, another discovery a paradigm shift in in this kind of thinking comes around and we can sort of reify certain ideas a little more closely to to mapping that yeah. what a, a concept yeah. to reality yeah so so yeah i mean if you can marry yeah. a system to a flexibility then then i think that's that for me it it, it down it tamps down the suffering a little bit or the you know yeah. the, the frustration maybe when you feel like nobody's getting it or you're not getting it or they're not getting it or whatever and then and then then yeah and then the the more you have like um, a a grip on how language works that the easier that becomes because um you you know essentially like you know even the hardest sciences that they're using metaphors they have a sort of metaphorical system Mm -hmm. that works well enough to allow them to like make predictions about that system but yeah you know that they're they're, it's it's fundamentally metaphorical and yeah and 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 the more you can have a sense about the system works the i think the easier the easier it becomes which is yeah which which is what i'm i'm doing a bit i'm doing my best to understand and do my best to um like teach other people to understand as well i will make sure that your contact information or not your personal contact information but for the semantics project that you and rosalind are doing uh will yeah, be, no, will be yeah, yeah please Hello. please yeah. please reach out like i i like to i like to receive mail especially okay good good like well all of that language. yeah all of that will be in the description field for this conversation. And I really, this would maybe be a good place to stop. And then we can pick up again and, 
and we'll Let's find something that. else to talk about. But uh, yeah. we've given them a lot, <laughs> given ourselves yeah. a lot. So, yeah. Dr. Crane, I really want to thank you for this conversation. Uh, I language fascinates me. I, you know, other than speaking, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know the mechanics <laughs> behind it. So I appreciate your coming here and and uh, speaking to that. And um, like I said, I think we can we can pick up and have another conversation uh, from another angle or another perspective. And and move on from ah, there thank you so much this is, yeah. this is tremendous fun yeah. oh good good and youtube audience thank you thank you all so much for being present with us in, in the conversation <laughs> asymmetrically of course but you can always comment down below and and or reach out to dr crane and uh through the semantrics website yeah. so and any other socials that i might post up all right so we'll to, yeah. to be continued and again thank you, you. i appreciate thank you it so much. yeah and i'll say goodbye to you once we're done recording but to the youtube audience yeah. thanks again take care everyone take care bye Bye-bye.